We're going to call the meeting to order. And first up is public comment. This is comment on anything that's not on the agenda. Yep, just state your name for the record. Hi, my name's Nicole Sear. Um, and my comment today, I'm from Bethel, if, I hope that's okay. I use the park often. Um, and my comment is about the uh, disc golf course. And because it's like a kind of visual thing, I made a little packet. But don't worry, this can going to be a very brief comment. I want to bet. i got to get to the store. So. <laughs> Um, let's see. Oh, there's I can take an extra for someone who comes here. Yeah. Yeah. And I was kind of scared too. Um, so, why am I here? I helped build the disc golf course back in 2003, and I recently noticed that some new baskets were installed. And as I was kind of going around trying to figure out how they got installed, who approved them, I found out that they didn't go through any formal approval process. Um, they actually got installed like within two weeks of the flood because the other baskets washed out. So, you know, before anyone had a chance to assess the damage to the park, um, these, these baskets, baskets just kind of got slammed into the ground. And I do have some specific concerns with the baskets, which I elaborate more in that handout. Um, so, uh, before you go, have you talked with anybody in the rec program? So I, asked, I did ask Morgan about it, and she referred me to Tyler. And Tyler was like upset with me and told me to take it up with the town. Um, and so I'm bringing this up with you because, like I said, I've been kind of watching this space for 20 years. And you know, we have these specific concerns with the baskets, like they're outside of the original footprint of the course, with the exception of the one that's on the old 10. Um, they cross the pedestrian walking path in three places. One of them is improperly installed. It's suspended between two trees on a steel cable. Um, and there's also impacts on the forest to consider when we move these baskets around. Um, one of them crosses a vernal pool. Um, some of the baskets are poorly placed in relation to the trees. And there's also a, at least one alteration to the original course where the old 12 was extended. So now that's across the pedestrian path. Um, and there wasn't any open discussion about this. So the original designer of the course has passed away. And at this point, I, I personally feel some sort of sentimental value in the actual design of the course, as though it's like kind of a piece of art. Um, but nobody was consulted before that basket was moved and the original design was altered. And these baskets, they're set in concrete, like two or three feet into the ground. They're meant to be permanent installations. And where they are located, it does matter because they have heavy impacts on the forest. There are trees that are damaged, there are trees that are dead, the soil is getting compact, the native plants are getting trampled, and then they're getting mowed, and they're getting pruned. <laughs> um, and there's also just the design aesthetic, like the old 12 was never meant to be a long shot, it was kind of meant to be short and sweet before you do the next basket where you cross the river. So, you know, my real concern, other than these kind of like, you know, little concerns about the pedestrian path is that there's this long history this long precedent of the process being that the disc golf volunteers kind of go in the woods and do what they want and nobody sees it and nobody talks about it so there's like several signs installed into trees there are baskets or benches installed into trees and for the past 20 years the volunteers have really been left alone and the rec directors are really hands off and that's not to say anything bad about the volunteers or the rec directors. That's just how it's been. And so I'm calling this to your attention now because we might flood again. And what happens then? How are we going to figure out where the baskets go? Or if the volunteers just decide next week that they want to dig up and move two more baskets, how, how is the public even going to have a chance to comment on that? So, you know, we have 20 years of different volunteers, different recreation directors, and there's a big gray area here. There's no real guidance, no real rules, no real supervision, um, you know, and it's, this course looks so much different than the original vision. Um, the original vision, it was just like this little forested walking trail, you know, it was really light use, it wasn't popular. Um, but the volunteers, like, now they're making some big changes with maintenance and stuff, and on top of that, disc golf is like wildly popular. Ever since COVID, people are just, they want to go play disc golf. Um, and there's some other factors influencing the popularity. Um, so, yeah, that's the first concern is that there's this 
volunteer group that's really doing a lot of stuff in the forest without anyone fully supervising them or guiding them. Um, and then the second concern is the actual impacts on the forest. I've watched it over the past 20 years. Like, I've just been going back, not, not meaning to watch it, but just observing. And there's a lot of trees that are damaged, and several trees have died. The soil is really compact, and the native plants, they're being like trampled and mowed down. Um, so, you know, after all this, after 20 years, two floods, several town managers, several recreation directors, I think this might be a good time to just like pause and review and ask some questions. Like, is this the vision that was approved in 2023? Do we actually want a floodplain forest with the native habitat, or are we okay with the grassy meadow with trees? Because it's, it's kind of up to everybody, you know? Like, if everyone's okay with it, then you're okay with it. Um, and how do these forest changes, how do they impact the ability of the floodplain to work for the town during flooding events? Um, something to consider is, so, do we actually have room for 18 holes anymore? And where's and Nicole, the balance? I'm going to stop you because what, what the public comment is for is to give us just a brief to decide if we want to put it on as a topic for another board meeting or if we want to toss it to staff to the town manager to look into it, get back to the board. Okay, yeah, and that's so, pretty much the end of it, just kind of giving these thinking questions and, you know, suggestions. I suggest to put the old tone back. I'll volunteer to do that myself if someone approves it. Um, you know, try to get the volunteers to actually submit something for approval and public comment so people have a chance to weigh in um, and possibly like pull together a group to talk about the future of the course, which when I did check in with Morgan, she did say she had some kind of plan to do that. So I think that's a really good course of action and should include all, like, all of these concerns. Um, yep. But I'll let you all know, I did try to chat with the volunteer, the leader of the volunteers, and it was, there's a lot of friction in the conversation. It was one of the least professional conversations I've had in a while. And I am like surprised at how much stress this has caused me because I thought I'd be able to just do a little walk around the course and kind of talk about some stuff. And at this point, I just want to share with you my experience, share with you my insight, and just go back home and away from all of this. <laughs> okay. So what we'll do is, uh, unfortunately, toss it to Trevor as the town manager. <laughs> Because it's kind of in his um, <coughs> bailiwick, and um, let him look into it and work on like what that needs to look like, and if there's an issue and whatnot, I'd and he'll get back to the be board so on it. I'm curious to know what the original agreement was. This is well, I don't. This is another meeting. Into a ton, into but, but we're not getting yeah. into this. No, this is just no, to put it up. It's. That's your packet of some background smell. Thanks, Morgan. And it's in the Herald. Okay. It's also in the Herald. All right, but no, we're, just, we're moving on. The topic's been introduced. We're tossing it to Trevor. We're moving on. No. I have received a formal yep. no. report from her, so you have that. Thank you. But I said no because we're moving on. Great. We got the cool. topic, and we're taking it to the I'm out. town manager. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Next up is approval of the agenda. Do we have any changes to the agenda? <laughs> Don't have any for you. None. Okay. Move that we approve the agenda. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Consent calendar. We have many meeting minutes of May 9th and uh, warrants. Move that we approve the consent calendar. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next up is uh, public assembly permits and banner placement applications for three events. So the three are, as foreshadowed last time, the July 4th parade. That's got the assembly permit and the banner placement application that's in there. There was one received last week for fireworks on July 3rd um, up at Far Hill, as in years past. And there's one for a Make Music Vermont Day. Don't. I see Paul for the fireworks. I see Linda for the parade. I don't know if anybody's here for Make Music Day, so we'll cover that the best we can when that comes up. Or if anybody online, maybe, is that Jess? Um, I'm what? here. Yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Jess Wilkinson here for Make Music Day, Randolph. Thanks. So, yeah, so we got Jess for, for that as well. So I don't know if you just want to take them in the order listed. and. 
Sure. Why not? Um, first up is the parade. Maybe we can um, get an update on where things are at with lining up volunteers and all that. I have a huge spreadsheet list of volunteers here. We're up to 21, mm -hmm. including parade walkers and people who are willing to do traffic control and crowd control. Okay. And Is you that, needed, what, 25? Yeah, that, that's total, so that gets you your volunteers in the, we were always calling the red vest when we met. That's the yeah. same group. And they're okay. differentiated. Do you want a copy, Trevor? Uh, he, is it? You have them. Yeah. You have so parade okay, walker good. would be the red vest, right? Yes. Okay. Thanks, Linda. And we have uh, eight officers and four marked units in a contract with the PD on that. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Any other questions on the plans that the planned route or coverage for volunteers? Nothing. Okay. So this is one of the things we talked about when Linda and Scott and I got together at one point and the map <coughs> sort of reflects it. It's got some of the shows you the locations of the police vehicles where volunteers would be the red vests are in the parade. Um, also tries to break down who's where um, and we talked about it that if we weren't able to get to that magic volunteer number for safety and efficiency sake there, there was a modified route that was discussed I think Scott called it the straight shot um, so it skips the little Maple Highland Jag but if you're at 21 and we have a we set a deadline more as a planning check-in date than a hard and fast one so if they're at 21 and the goal is 25 that's, I think we'll that's pretty there. close <laughs> So you just may want to structure your motion to allow for either one um, if you get to that point, but it seems like it's going to be, if they reach that count, they can keep the traditional route and, and pull it off pretty safely. And then let's go through some of the things we talked about with communications and other things that have come up in past years that we wanted to make sure we tried to iron out. You've seen the list of the notes of things that were talked about yes with them and you agree with all of them i think that that we've got it pretty much covered with all okay. the concerns yeah okay and we're going to have more radios this year as well i've ordered 15 radios so that a lot of people will be in constant touch we can chit chat okay any other questions from anyone if not a motion make a motion to approve fourth of july parade second all those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. <laughs> Next up is the fireworks. <laughs> the fireworks. Is that yours, Paul? Oh, yes. Yep. Um, everybody saw that. You have the contract with Randolph PD, too? That you yes. saw in your application? Yep. yep. Anybody have any questions on that one? If not, yeah. entertain a motion to approve it. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And Make Music Vermont. Oh, we Did the banner. Anybody? Can we have a, a decision on the banner, please? Yeah, we'll come back to oh, it. That, oh, sorry. Um, just um, Make Music Vermont. We have a plan in there for that. Anybody have any questions on that one? That's the one setting up music. Over by the old co-op, I can still call it co-op building. Yeah. Didn't myself, but yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> we're good. <laughs> no questions. Motions to approve. So moved. A second. Set that one out. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And then we have a banner request um, to go up for 4th of July, but we've always approved those since we had trouble with the two buildings on each side to go on the gazebo. So we've been hanging those. This one is just for the pole banners. Okay. There's no lot, no bigger one anymore. We've we never approved we the pole banners. Have it, so we? we didn't do it. We've never, never approved those. That's always been a town manager decision. Yeah. I say if it's just the pole banners, I can handle that one for you yeah. if you want. Sounds okay. good. Perfect. That's between you and Trevor. Full banners. <laughs> Sounds good. formal. I'll Thank sign you. everything. We'll get everything signed. Judy, get, Judy gets me organized. I've got the full signed up. Mine All right. Our ACDC okay. first Friday rain dates. Okay. 
so this is basically they got what is it a quartet of rain dates they're all the second Friday I believe is how that works out um, so they just want to make sure they've got approval for those we've allowed rain dates in the past I believe so I don't think this is new just doing it on the front end might be a little newer I think anybody's here for that, but you want to delay it. There's, a, I mean, there's somebody new at RCD, and I don't know if that's who. I don't recognize Rose Lucenti, and I apologize if it has nothing to do with this, but but yeah, it's just it's just setting rain dates basically, and they're in the report. But I cannot put my hands on. Anybody have any concerns with it when you read the report of rain dates? Mike said, "Um, we did not see an assembly permit for them this year. I and mean, in the past, we've had issues with their site plans, um, mainly storing uh, gas cylinders in areas that we couldn't get access to for the emergency service. So I'm just wondering how that made it through the process without us getting some say. I think the process we had was on uh, closing the street, right?" Is that what we approved? Yeah, I'm trying to remember even this came a couple of times um, as there was a change because originally the first one had Saturdays in it and then there were Fridays and it went back and forth. So you've seen it a couple and of times. And we didn't have bunch. anything that showed gas cylinders. They did that in the past, that they said they weren't going to have food and then they had gas cylinders and food vendors and stuff after and asked permission after the fact. Well, they haven't come in asking permission for that, so... Well, it's because we caught them. They asked for permission oh. from us after the fact. <laughs> well, they might do it again this year. Um, we can reach out to them and ask them if they're going to have it and clarify because they haven't brought any of that forward. Okay. Our, our okay. concern is just the location and being able to get to it easily mm -hmm. beyond the barriers. The closer they are to the ends of the street, the better for us. Yeah. Yes. Um, we can check with them. But I, I didn't see anything like that that I remember. Well, should we postpone it and check with them? Well, this is just approving rain dates. We've already approved the events. Um, I think I changing the rain date isn't going to make any difference, right, at this point. It's just saying we can have this day or that day. What we need to do is have them come back and explain to us if there's any, or let them know that they're not approved for any gas tanks unless they come back and yeah, show us that they've met with the fire department. All right. Did we have motions on that, Trevor? I don't have any yet, but I recorded. Okay. Any issues with changing the green dates? Anybody want to make a motion to change them? To allow them, right? We're not changing them. We're allowing green dates. I'll, I'll move that we allow the green dates as proposed. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next up is to consider the preservation trust easement and general discussion with the trustees. Um, but we haven't gotten on the easement itself. Have we gotten and you haven't got any other information yet, right? From uh, Jenna from PVT and I have engaged in a game of tag. We just haven't connected fully. But I sent everything over to try well not everything I sent some questions over to say here's what we're looking to connect on um, we don't but, have but just did that and it's, it's uh, mutual it's just scheduling it's nothing nobody's okay all right okay so yeah I just wanted to know if we'd gotten our the questions answered that we had but okay it probably would have, that's coming later in my conversation you know in the conversation I wanted to have that was, but I'm wondering why the trustees are not have not yet been made aware of said questions since all of the administration of that stuff falls under our statutory responsibility. But let's start at the beginning of where I went, where I had wanted to start. Um, the first part was to update you about a, a bit about S twenty twenty and some of the changes. And I have I have the brief handout from the legislature about that that you can. 
Um, you can tell. I'm going to keep one copy. Um, the three things that strike the, me as important, um, the first one is, oh, what is I need my notes so that I don't lose track. Where I so you, you um, have the X on your packets too. This is the thing you sent you to. So the the first important thing and the thing that you're likely to hear about from somewhere is that the age of confidentiality for library records has been reduced from the age from 16 to 12. Um, I can't answer specific what the Vermont Library Department, the Board of Libraries, has suggested to us is that if you have a good policy around managing confidentiality for 16-year-olds, that it's more a matter of changing the date. But the, our board doesn't meet until next week, so I don't have answers to specific questions about what that might entail. However, I, I suspect that somewhere along the way, it's, it's going to come up. Um, we've dealt pretty successfully. I think Amy and the librarians have dealt really successfully with that, the confidentiality <coughs> piece over the years. So. I don't know that anybody on the board is anticipating big, big questions about that or big agita about that. Um, the second is that as a part of the policy review process, that actually, and you should know that that takes effect July 1st of this and year. So if I understand that a parent has no rights to know what their child's signing out for books if they're 12 and older. Yes. That's, that's sort of the short answer. But they can keep their kid from going to the library, right? Yep. We would like them not to do that. Um. But. <laughs> but <laughs> I wonder what the um, logic is. That have you been part of any of the process for that? What the logic is behind dropping it to 12? Mm -hmm. you, Go ahead. So the logic arises from a year-long study that was done about the state of libraries in Vermont. And at age 12, um, youth can gain access to um, mental health and, and physical health services without their parents' approval, and their records are private from their parents unless the child or the young person signs a release. So it will be a similar situation at Kindle Library. Right now, at age 16, we inform patrons that unless we have their written permission, we're not going to talk to anybody about their library usage, including their parent or guardian. And we'll just have to ship that down to 12-year-olds. And up. Wow. 12-year-olds, like 16-year-olds now, are, now yeah. are able to give that permission. Um, I think that if you, at the age of 12, when my kids were using the library actively, if you had asked them, you know, can we talk to your mom? They probably would have said, yeah. You know, so it, We just had this conversation, though, kids back when we were raising mm -hmm. our kids, and kids today are in a whole different world and a whole they different are. environment and a whole different expectation and whatnot. So yeah. I'm not sure we can use that. Because you're right, they would have said, yeah, whatever. You know, you well, move, and, you know, for today. my kids, I never censored what they read. You know, if they were reading, if I saw it and they had questions, we I read it. If I hadn't read it already, and we talked about it, um, and it became it became a community part of our family community. And I understand that not every family runs that way. But okay. um, the second thing is that in um, so the library, you should know that the trustees have a schedule for policy review. Um, they all get looked at roughly once a year, um, depending on where they land on the calendar. And the ask now is that in that review that all of that language be compliant with civil rights laws and the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, I'm not anticipating having gone through our policies in below the many years that I have been a trustee. I'm not anticipating huge changes there. Um, but there's probably going to be some tweaking that we'll need to do with the language. That piece doesn't take effect until next year, so we've got some time. Um, and the Vermont Library Association will provide model policy language that can be used to make sure that we're all in the right spot. Um, so the, th the third part 
Um, there's, there's a bunch of other stuff in there as well, but pertinent to this group um, is that there is some clarification and standardization of the language around what municipal library boards are responsible for and where the line is between what we do and what y'all do and what the town manager does. Um, and I think that that's important um, because putting things into words gives some clarity to it. And, and I think that, you know, particularly because turnover creates mushy spaces. And Trini, you and I are the only people in the room <laughs> that were here besides Amy. The last time we had conversations with, um, you know, town administration and with the select board about what the library does and how the library board behaves and what we're allowed to, you know, the decisions that we're allowed to make. You are an entirely new select board. You have a different treasurer, different all of that. And so what this does, and I thank the legislature for this, is remove some of the mushy gray stuff that, that I think happens when you have different people in charge. Okay. Um, so one of the things that, you know, and I'll run down the list, but are as municipal as, a, as an elected board, okay, we sit in roughly the same spot relative to the town as you do, and as the folks who manage the, the investments for the town. You know, we have responsibilities, your responsibilities as a board pick up where we leave, leave off. You know, that's the way the statutes I think the way the statutes are written as I went pouring through them prior to coming here. Um, it's our job to manage the library and any property that comes into the library, into the hands of muni the municipality by gift, purchase, device, or bequest for the use and benefit of the library. Um, we adopt the bylaws and policies governing the operation of the library. We elect our officers, establish policies, control and manage property that comes into the yada da, same, same story. Establish the library budget, hold regular meetings, and ensure compliance with the terms of any funding, grants, or bequests. Um, in addition, we supervise the librarian. Okay, so all of that has been codified now as part of our statutory responsibilities. And having it written out that way I think makes it clearer for everybody and maybe a little easier to draw the lines about where our job ends and, and your job starts. And for, for Trevor in particular, I think, you know, in how he interacts with the board about things but like it, <clears throat> So uh, help me understand that, like, is it that clear? Yes. It, does the library have to follow the town's policies or you don't follow any of them? Well, so the town yeah. has a procurement policy, for we, example. We do. We do, and we follow the procurement policy because that's that's the deal, right? You have, we, we are in some ways a town office, and we historically have followed the procurement policy, and so, yeah, mm -hmm. we do that. Um, this does set me up for the third thing on my, my right. list but, of things that I wanted to talk with you about, and that was the grants policy. But so when you're talking though about, before we get to that, you're okay. talking about supervision and whatnot. So does, how does that work then? Like we you said that Amy. it draws a line between you guys mm -hmm. and Trevor, but so how, like where is that line when it comes, like overall Trevor's responsible for the town budget. Well. Right, of which the library is a portion of. He's, so, it, the responsibility of the town manager from the research that I did um, is he's the administrative head of departments. Um, he performs all duties not committed to another office. Okay, that's very similar to the select board, I think. Um, performs select board duties. There's a, a role out there. Um, general is the general purchasing agent, has charge of town buildings, including school buildings upon requisition of the Board of School Directors. So they have to ask you to do that, I guess, right? Um, <clears throat> we can refuse. He can. You can. He can. <laughs> we don't um, want more. There isn't, anything, there isn't anything about the library 
in any of the duties of the town manager? Well, buildings, right? The building belongs to the town. The, the building belongs to the town, and there are municipal funds that go from the town to the building, and we, I don't think you've ever known us to not be compliant with town policy. No, I just, I don't think it's as black and white as you're painting it. I, I think there's still some areas that you got to work through and figure out what, sure. like if you guys get sued, who's, you have to go hire your own lawyer? I, it would be, I, we are elected as a, as a body of the town, and so I'm assuming that we would have access to the town's attorney for that town legal counsel. I don't know. We would, that's a question that comes up. You know, that, that's one of those things. Which is a general fund expense currently. I would assume that if you were sued, the town is sued, and that the town has to be involved, which would mean Trevor's involved, and that it would have to go through the League of Cities and Towns and all that, wouldn't it? Or is it really they're just on their own to go? Like, I, I don't yep. see it's black and white, isn't it? It's Not at all. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm just saying you're, you're saying it's black and white now. It's not, I, in my I opinion. Provides, I think there's I still a lot of roles that the I, town has. I didn't say there weren't. And, and I don't mean black and white. I do mean more clarity, that there is some more clarity. And, and I think that the lines between the elected boards are easier to see um, and at least easier to have conversations about and may eliminate having the language be statutory language in this way may help alleviate some of the concerns that happen with turnover. Okay, so that's that's my, my thing there. Um, and, and the same for, you know, the select board has general supervision over the affairs of the town. And so that brings me up to the easements, okay, to the, because the town directed us, we started this process, the, the first grant that, the, my first question is, has the town policy about grants changed or is what's on the website the current policy? There's a revision underway to try to get us better organized, but we haven't concluded that process yet. So, so the policy that is currently posted on the website is the operative policy. Until it's replaced by something that... Right now. Is that the operative policy? Why don't you just get to the point rather than the cross-examination? The the, so the question, the town policy on the website says that you have to approve that the select board has the authority and the right to approve the application of grants for grants. Correct. We have a number of grants that have come before the select board that the select board has beginning in January of 2022 that the select board has approved the application of those grants. Mm -hmm. There isn't anything in the policy that indicates that accepting those grants has to happen before the select board. Um, and so that's part of my question, because I think it relates to the question about easements. The trustees have charge of the building and the budget and the supervision of the library, you know, the, of the librarian and all the things related to the library within the guidelines that the town sets because we have, you know, because we get municipal funds and we are a municipal board. In many ways, we exist in the same kind of a strata as the folks who manage investments for the town. Right? We, there's a certain amount of agency and independence there. And there's a place where things intersect you know, where, where stuff intersects. It is my understanding that there were questions raised about the historic, the easements associated with the parks grant, with the, you know, the grant that, uh, probably specifically if I had to guess, because nobody has told the board, um, specifically the permanent easement that's required by one of the grants. Uh, the Vermont. So, 
I'm, so I have a couple of questions related to that and, and also some commentary. The library is a historic building. It's listed on the historic register. It is part of what got Randolph designated downtown status. We are a municipal board and so we, we have some, you know, some statutory re responsibility toward that building and toward the town that, um, the community that elected us. It does rather boggle my mind that at when we, between the time in which we were informed that the grant had been awarded and now, that I have absolutely no idea, the board has absolutely no idea what the concerns of the select board were. We have no idea what the concerns of town council were about the easement. I would offer out that easements around historic buildings and around funding to maintain historic buildings and do repairs, like our roof and cupola, that those easements are part and parcel of those grants. That's, it is just the way they are awarded. It's a part of doing business. They are meant to ensure that the character of the building is preserved through whatever renovations need to happen. There were, if you need an example of what that might look like, there were easements that were granted that were associated with the Red Schoolhouse. When the renovation was done on the Red Schoolhouse, lo those many years ago, up in Randolph Center and on Allen House on the Vermont Tech campus. And it was important to have those because both of those are historic buildings, as is Judd. You know? so, so those easements, they're just a piece of the grant. And without knowing what the concerns were, there is no way for the Board of Trustees of the library to be able to respond to those concerns in a way to set your mind at ease. But I also think that I'm not sure why, if you've told us that it's okay to apply for the grants, and I'm assuming that, you know, when you do that, because you're a responsible group of folks, that you understand what the historic preservation, I mean, Trini, you did some of the grant searching with us, um, that you understand what the, what the requirements are in general for those grants why this is a problem now and why we don't know what the concerns were so so the application if i'm mis not mistaken the application actually submitted didn't come back to the board to approve it was the concept of we would like to apply for this grant through this funding source can we have approval to do that i don't believe we ever saw the full application that gets submitted and whatnot and we don't see that on a lot of them Okay. Right, like it comes in and they say, hey, can we apply for this money? The whole idea is by the time it comes in and whatnot, you have the requirements, then the board can look at anything that's out of the ordinary. Putting an easement on a building owned by the town mm -hmm. for in perpetuity that has requirements in it like this one has causes a lot of heartache looking at it when we look at how we prioritize the capital program, how we prioritize work done on buildings and all that, because there's a requirement in there that we maintain that building and do the work that the Preservation Trust identifies they want done. So that's where our problem is, is what is this language saying, how does it work, and what does that look like? Because we can't have an easement for the life of that building controlling how the town invests the limited money we have in other buildings around the town to keep them going. Why was the Board of Trustees not included in that conversation? We were told so that because you've been asked or Trevor has been asked on a number of occasions and the first response if I've got the chronology right was the select board has some concerns. Well, what are those concerns? Well, we're going to talk to the attorney. And then it went, well, we have attorney-client privilege. And the, the town's attorney serves us as well. 
And then it was that it went into executive session at the last meeting. Was that part of the conversation? No? So we asked them to go to the attorney and get us information that came out. And we had mm -hmm. some follow-up questions. And that's where we're at right now. So we meet once a month. So do we. And we actually, the questions that we've had are for the Preservation Trust. And as you heard at the start, we haven't got those questions answered yet to be able to get a legal opinion of what that is and whether we can go back to the Preservation Trust and negotiate what that means, like what that language is and what does it mean. It begs the question of why the Board of Trustees was not included. My understanding is we were still trying to get a legal opinion. Which, I, which shouldn't is where we're at. Yeah, that shouldn't leave us out, Jimmy. It's our job but, to maintain that building. It's our job to make sure that those grant requirements are met. It's our job to to do all of those things, right? That's that's always been a part of our statutory responsibility, particularly as a municipal board. So, and, could you have? come to the meeting when it was on the agenda for us to discuss? Or like I would how, have if I had been how invited. Would, I mean, the select, select board we... meetings are not on my normal monthly role. But but had I known, and, and I'm not sure that it was on the agenda. I, I would go look back at the, at the agenda for the last meeting, and it was not there, because I did check. If you're receiving the advice from the attorney, it would appear as that under the executive session item, not as a separate conversation, mm -hmm. which is how all of that, regardless of topic, is listed on an agenda. So there would have been no way for the Board of Trustees, the Library at Kimball Board of Trustees, to know that we should have been here. And I not it's not clear to me that we if you were heading into executive session that we would have been included at that point anyway. You wouldn't have been included in the executive session because okay. so, that's a lawyer to so the town. Moot, moot point. Right? Conversation there, um, but we was it the one before that we talked about it and, and asked and you to get the lawyer. We were, since we were the, uh, the grant applicant and had the paperwork in front of us, we could have. It might have been that we would have been helpful with the preservation trust. We haven't got to them yet. Using a response. Out some, of them. So some questions in a conversation was last I knew and the schedules just kept conflicting. I met with Jenna Lapachinsky about a month and a half ago. So I've been able to converse with her and talk about how we're going to move forward with the, is it five different grants now that we've secured to do the work that the municipal taxpayers are not being expected to bear the cost of. Which, so, which was at the direction of the select board. So there's a limited amount of municipal funds available, and what you get is what's in the allotment that passes at town meeting, right? And, and the, the money that the town allocated in support of the very first grant back in January of 2022, right? Um, so we've done what you have asked us to do, to be boxed out of, it feels as though we have been boxed out of the process here. I don't think and you're being boxed out. I don't think we know what the conversation is yet. With the legal you, opinion we have and not having some questions answered, I'm I, not sure we are ready or have answers to even have that conversation. I, I mean, it we, might be helpful. Have you had any conversations with the Preservation Trust about whether it has to be an in perpetuity easement and whether it can be better defined or like you have absolutely no we, we didn't know that that was the problem there was speculation that that was the problem because i think that per perpetual easements are i i think they're just hard kind of hard to swallow yeah. but and and i think trevor gave amy to understand that easements were were the concern, but if there were specific concerns or specific questions, no, we didn't know. We we were not told. Okay. And so to show up at a meeting, you know, it, it, especially if we wouldn't have been included in the first place. So it's, 
I, I think some clarity about who owns what parts of the job, I think that's, that would be helpful. Um, but we'll but, but I also think that we're the elected representatives that are responsible for the library. You know, that's, that's what we do. And to leave us out of those conversations at any point, if there are concerns, feels really inappropriate. I don't think there was any intent there to leave you out. I think we need to educate ourselves on what what it really is. Like, yeah. what is this easement? What is it it's, really? Because embedded in the question are the larger question of who's responsible for what. So you need advice on what your role is, independent on the advice that would be what their role is, independent of the advice of what does the easement mean for everybody. So one of the pieces you got was on what your role is, what those boundaries are. Mm -hmm. which is particular to you as a body and has nothing to do necessarily except for how it relates to them eventually at some point and how it all comes together as one so, so some of that what you i can i just finish like i've sure. sat through all of this robin can i just have it, have it. you know what i'm i'm done all set we'll continue and get with preservation trust um, and see if they can schedule a time to have the conversation about what this really is that they're after. Like, I don't see us supporting an in perpetuity easement on town owned building that ties our hands of how we spend our capital program funds. That's where the challenge is. And so if the preservation trust can come in and tell the town what we have to do and how much, you know, and what that is, no matter what else we have from needs in the town that's where we're having the challenge and we're having the same issue with the chandler one so it's not just one grant right now there's two mm -hmm. but chandler they didn't ask for an in perpetuity chandler they only asked for a 15 year so what's the difference and some of them can be five year so what's the what's the difference in the that? difference in this case is the vermont housing and conservation board are the folks who are requiring an easement on the $200,000 grant that okay. we proposed to make. It's not the Preservation Trust. The Preservation Trust holds the easement, but it's the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board that is requiring this. So it's a different entity. Yep. And I, I did not read at all that the Preservation Trust gets to come in and tell the library trustees how they manage their building. What I read is that if there are changes that the library trustees propose to make or repairs that they identify that need to be made, that they seek guidance, the guidance of the preservation trust to make sure that it's done up to historical preservation standards. Yeah. Unfortunately, the town lawyer reads it differently. So. Well, I would like to be included in the meeting with Jenna and Trevor so that I'm informed about what's going on and therefore I can inform the library about the status well I think now we're getting down to like what that is what's what is that role and and who's you know if we we asked Trevor to look into it for as far as the select board was concerned mm -hmm. so it was what is the role of the select board and what is the town being committed to here that I think is different in some ways because we have to understand to create our position on what we will and won't go on and it's on both so it's not even just your project mm -hmm. that he needs to talk to him on he needs the, the conversation is on two different grants and two different buildings at this point and what yes. is the town signing on to and and the attorney says yes that they we are signing away I think he said it's dancing with the devil I urge you cool. also to remember that Chandler Music Hall and Kimball Library are not in any way analogous and by that I mean that the library has an elected board of trustees. They're officers of the town. Chandler Center for the Arts is a nonprofit that leases Chandler Music Hall from the town. So the town, the, the select board has a responsibility for that building. That is not the same as the library trustees responsibility for Kimball Library. They're not analogous. But the town has the liability of, with that building, too. 
and the town elected officials to manage the building are at the library trustees. So you're saying the select board has no role in that building? I'm saying that according to statute, the library trustees are, let me, let me read it here. The library trustee shall have full power to manage the public library. The library. But is that the building, the structure also, or is it just the functions of the library? Well, and that goes into effect when? In July? July. Well, that's, it's, so we're not under that right that's now. That's already language that's right? in, you know, that's already language that is in statute. There have been additional changes that have been made. Is there a definition section in that statute? There, I mean, all we got was the summary so is, of the changes. There is not. Um, but given the fact There's that then be other responsibilities are enumerated for the library board, like adopting bylaws, setting policy that governs the operation of the library, electing officers, establishing a library budget, holding regular meetings, supervising the library director, manage the public library does not seem to me to be an amorphous, like, you're just in charge of all the stuff with the library. It seems to me it's to be very specific. Operational. No, not operation. Not operation. I would argue it is. I guess we got to look at, I mean, that's, we got to look at it. What's the, no, that, I, that's not going to help me. I need the definitions okay. at the beginning of the statute. That there are, where they de define what those Managed words public are. library is not. Is public library in there? I don't know. Right? Because you can manage you. something, but if you're, if you're, that's where we got to, but that's the detail we got to figure out. Like, if that's the case and the town has no say on the building, then that's a different story. But right now we have a say in the building. I don't think there's any intent to take away, I mean, I didn't read it when, when I read through it um, as taking away any of the town's responsibility toward the building. Um, I think the language around that is around what the select board responsibility is toward public buildings, which is maintained, da 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 da. But it, you know, that's, that is the same. Um, and for things that are fall outside the capa you know the capacity, the budgetary capacity, then you go for grants, right? Or you do what Chandler did, which is a capital campaign. Um, it, it doesn't feel to me, and I think it doesn't feel to me to be as big and scary um, as it was. And really, on behalf of the board, the, the larger problem is being included. You know, yes. we're an elected board and we have statutory responsibilities toward the library and to not have an opportunity to hear and respond and be a part of the investigation of concerns. Um, I makes it, it, it just makes life difficult. And I think, I, so. Um, anybody else have any comments or questions on this? And I don't know, as a board, we're ready to act until we know kind of what it is. I don't have any problem of once we kind of know what we're dealing with, sitting down and having the conversation. But I think now this new statute makes it muddier to me. Like, I think we got to go back and get clarity from the lawyer of, like, what does this change mean? Like, what is the role of the select board here? And what isn't the role? Yeah. I do think is there some of this. a way to have the lawyer at a select board meeting for executive session and invite the trustees? You could. Yep. Do you feel, though, as a board, we need to kind of understand what our role and place is and what are, what's us and what's not us before we do that? Unless we can just figure that out in executive session with, I mean. Mm -hmm. well, that's, I mean, that's just a matter of information. We can get that information before a meeting and, yeah. and decide. 
I don't know if the agenda for the meeting. What it might be a meeting point, point, right? If it's if it's not us, sure. and this tra statute changes it, then I mean, I, I think we got some decisions to make about a few buildings in this town, but. Which I think Chamber's one, but I certainly like the idea of working collaboratively with the library trustees as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Um, I think to some point right now we we'll go back to the town attorney and get clarity on what this law does to roles and responsibilities. And then um, discuss with them um, this, the preservation trustees. May, well, he's already given us his opinion on that. So um, it may come down to needing to get them in the room also to have this discussion about what it is. And because we're getting. Feeling the trustees might like to have. A conversation with the attorney as well. Yeah, well, I think it, the preservation trust needs to be there too to have that, or the grant, whoever the granting entity is, right? To, we need to have that conversation of why does this have to be in perpetuity? Why does it, you know, why can you, you have the flexibility to do a five year? Why are you doing it as forever? And can you limit it in scope to? you can tell us what to do on that part you invested in versus the entire building. So the Preservation Trust, I think Amy said, it's not the Preservation Trust that's requesting the easement in perpetuity. It's Vermont Housing and Conservation Vermont Board. Housing and Conservation Who's Board. the grant with? Vermont that's Housing, and Conservation, Housing Board. and Conservation Board. Housing and Conservation Board. The Preservation Trust administers. But that's the, e but, the easement the is a preservation easement with a grant from Vermont Housing, ha and, Housing Conservation. and Conservation Trust. Managed but by it's the a Preservation Trust. Right. So easements with PTV. VHCB often administers the yeah. easements on behalf of PTV. I okay. think it's the reverse in this case. Because the document. And the Preservation Trust of Vermont yeah. as the grantee. The I'm glad you brought that up, actually, because I don't think Jenna is the person to answer these questions. I think it's the attorney who sent this easement from the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And usually, with a grant, you work through whoever your project manager is or your grant administrator through that entity. So if Jenna is the grant manager and the point of contact we've been given, is that not who we would work through? Well, we got an additional grant from the Preservation Trust of Vermont, and for that grant, Jenna is the contact. So who's the contact in this one? Karen Freeman is the VHCB person, yeah. but the, it was a, an attorney who works for VHCB who sent the easement. And the and easement goes to the Preservation Trust of Vermont? We've is talked that? to Karen Freeman before as well. There are different layers to this based on the funding entities and who's listed on who's listed on the drafts that are right here that were provided i'll talk to whoever you want me to talk to i'm going by what's written down yeah. who's the name of the grantee in this case and it's the preservation trust um i'm looking at the easement and it says that the grant were is the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. So grant. how about if I But who, on the grant itself, not on the easement, but on the grant itself. The grant is who, the so the grant how about if board. I find the name of the attorney who sent the easement and send it to you, Trevor? That'd be wonderful. All right. Well, we're not gonna resolve this tonight. So we will Dig into this some more and be in touch. Is that fair? Okay. Don't think we can ask her more than that. Okay. Um, and so we're going to roll forward right into the Chandler Preservation Trust easement. <laughs> it's the same set of questions. Same thing. We can do that all in one meeting, I would think, for them or 
the fun series. Okay, we'll move on. Um, we do it at a special meeting? I think we need some answers and then we'll set right. something up. So it may be a work session where we take a couple board members and a couple of theirs and then we don't have to do a work session before we do anything that's a full meeting. That's what it's feeling like to me. That sounds good. And Trini, right. as just to finish, to close it out, the, the Kimball trustees are happy to work with the select board around ironing out questions about process and procedure and who owns what things. It, turnover, you know, turnover changes so many things. And, and maybe understanding that it's time to it's time to hash some of that stuff out in a more concrete way. Yep. You know, so that if you have a whole new board of select, you know, select board, and we have a, you know, every time it changes, every time the people change, you shouldn't have to be having the same flavor of conversation over and over again. You have change on your board too that we do. causes the we same do. challenge. So. so so yeah, no, it's change all the way around, right? Yeah. That's like I said in the beginning, I think you and I are the only and Amy are the only people who were here at the very beginning. I'm not sure I'm gonna brag about that one. <laughs> <laughs> not smart enough to do something different, I think. So thank but, you. Okay. Uh, U T V agreement. There's a new draft. The revised version Out based there. on the feedback from last time. I sent a copy to Mike the other day as well. I can go through what's different if you want. You can have a general conversation. There are some open policy questions. Okay. Um, hi, guys. Um, I think that our biggest one with this is how are the things going to get moved? I think that's the biggest issue. And I don't have a, an easy answer to that. And I, I think it's a, you can't move it with personal vehicles, right? And we can't move with the fire truck. And the town trucks are available, to, are, can move it if they're not on the other side of town or, or doing something. So. Thank you. Logistically, I think that's our biggest hurdle to get over. And we can put it in writing. It's beautiful if we say you can reach out to highways or buildings and grounds or the water sewer and have a truck come move it for you. But in practice, to me, that sounds clunk. That looks beautiful on paper. Operationally, I don't think it's going to work. It might work 50% of the time. Right? I would agree with that. A Sunday afternoon, somebody does something crazy out in the boondocks and you need to get the ATV there to do something. Where are you at? Right? Like. Yeah, I see the concerns. Um, I would raise the question how do 10 other towns do it with personal vehicles? I understand the liability associated with it, et cetera. But every town that we talk to that has it, all transport them with personal vehicles. That's firefighters who are responding to the call, whose vehicles are insured after the deductible is met. So you were on the board with me when we, <laughs> here we go, date ourselves, Mike. When we started in on trying to do the policy, remember, of, and there was, I don't remember who it was, was pushing that the town needed to pay the deductible if a firefighter wrecked their truck on the way to a call or on the way home. And we've got into the whole quagmire of how fast were they going? Do they stop at stop signs? You know, do they drive normal or do they are they ones the adrenaline takes over and you don't want to meet them on the road? And we never came to a conclusion on that. Right? We don't have a policy on it. We do, but it's the old one, I think. Yeah, like I the think way this, old I one. think the town still pays the deductible up to five hundred dollars or whatever. I think that's the policy, right? I didn't think, well, we never got the, ch the policy we were working on through, but I don't know. There was something there. Well, I think we were looking at changing there. that amount because people were going to higher deductible insurance to save money. And so we never changed the $500 to my knowledge, but I yeah. think the policy still exists there. I don't even know if it still exists. I think it was a practice more than a policy, wasn't it? I don't know. We'd have to go look at it. 
but that's the thing, like, right? So if I allow, if I allow one, somebody to hook on with their personal automobile, the trailer and the ATV, UTV are their responsibility. That becomes on their insurance. And so if I have the fireman who gets the call and he does the speed limit to get to the station and he, you know, obeys traffic laws and whatnot, probably not that big a risk. But if I take the other one whose adrenaline takes over and they go 65, 70 miles an hour to the station, and I know we have them, I've met them, they're not on their side of the road, they don't stop at the stop signs, and I'm going to allow him to hook onto the trailer, much bigger risk. Or her, because we have some of them too, but like that. No, I understand that. And, and it's part of all of our vehicles, right? I don't want anybody to drive my fire truck with this out. And I know in our membership who drives fast to the to the to the station, and then we have conversations that you know, you're not going to do this speed, you're not going to do this, you 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 are not immune to traffic laws, right? And so I know that the people who tend to operate the fire truck that way, I'm not going to you know I I suspend them. I've, I've told people you're not driving for two months until you can figure out how to control yourself, and they get pissed, but they figure it out. And so the same thing with this. I already know the people that initially that I would go through the any additional driver training necessary, and those would be the ones like I know you're going to do the speed limit there. I know you've driven the trailer before, etc. Yikes! It's a slippery slope. Um. No, I understand. I mean, our world is governed by insurance and liability. Yeah. Right. Everybody's this. They make the rules, everybody pays for it, and so on. So I know that I have guardrails on what I can do and not do as a fire chief and, when I, and how I train my members, how I teach my members, and how I authorize my members to do certain things, right? I got guys with CDLs that I haven't authorized to drive my fire truck yet because they haven't driven with me in it going through certain scenarios, right? And so within those guardrails is, is how we operate, and this isn't going to be any different, you know? We're perfectly fine with the ATV training that was suggested in the MOU. Uh, we would have done it anyway, right? Because it's, it's a different vehicle. It's a top-heavy vehicle. It's going to have water on it. It may have a basket on it with somebody on there. Not just going to let anybody do that. Everybody goes through a training course for everything that we do, right? From FF1 to driver training to SCBA, et cetera. So this would be no different piece of equipment to, to how we operate. Well, but it does, right? So right now, when they go through that training and they operate that equipment, they're operating it with everything, well, no, actually, because most of the assets are town-owned, right? So you do have some pieces of equipment that the town doesn't own that are on the truck and, and they operate, and that's another risk, right? We've talked about that, Wayne, about they go out and they do something crazy, somebody gets injured, and it's... The nonprofit's equipment, you're going to be sitting right beside us in court. Um, but I'm not sure how that works. And I, I wouldn't want to agree to something like that without having a pretty good conversation with the league because you're now taking a trailer and a piece of equipment owned by the town, putting it behind a personal automobile, and sending it into an emergency situation. Like, we're sending personal vehicles to an emergency situation. When we do wildland fires, our fire trucks go immediately and people show up in personal vehicles. That, that's different than with a trailer behind them. I don't think so. I think if I you do. show up on a scene and the wind changes and somebody's car catches fire, somebody's going to ask for money. I, don't, I, don't, I understand the risk associated with this, but the risk isn't necessarily different than somebody driving a personal vehicle to a scene. Especially if they're operating the way you just mentioned. Except for the, I mean, isn't the insurance? So it's the personal vehicle's insurance. And they don't have the same level of insurance that the town has. Right? So, like, well, and so um, depending what you're towing, so you, when you take out your insurance on a pickup, right, you can, you set the, the value on there 
and that's what you're capped at. Right. So if you don't set it high enough to cover the trailer and everything, and what you know what you're towing. Right. then that's what I'm it's saying not covered. Though. Like a personal but, vehicle, I wouldn't have insurance to cover doing this yeah. for the town. You also have to register your truck accordingly, right? So you're, if you have certain trucks, you have to register them for the weight of the truck and what you're towing. So then beyond the personal vehicle liability, then it would be back on the town. After that, like the town would get sued in addition to... Oh, we're going to get sued whether they have the insurance or not. If something happens, because yeah, we own the trailer and the truck and UTV, it's you know what's the how do you control that the the vehicle attaching to a town-owned piece of equipment is it is legal to do it right? Is it registered for it? Is it insured for it? And then what does that mean, like? Do they have to carry the town as an additional insured on their policy? I would think they would. Right? Right. I'm sorry, can you say that last part again? Um, so if you're, if you're doing work for a municipality or the state or anybody, um, or you're moving their stuff or whatever, you can, you usually go to your insurance agent and you add them as an additional insured. So if, if a firefighter is hooking onto the trailer in the UTV, the town would want to be an additional insured on their policy. So we're insured for the loss of that trailer, that UTV, and any damage that might happen to somebody's property or I don't know what. But you want to be more than just, well, they hooked on and maybe their insurance will cover it. You want to make sure that there's a... The insurance company knows that, that, that they're hooking to that and that it's covered. You're talking about cover for damage to the UTV and the trailer? Or you know, anything happening. Or, goes or around they a corner too fast go around a corner and wipe out somebody's property, else, or vehicle, some property damage. or. Right, but yeah. you, you don't require us to identify the town responding to a call. Once my fire light's on, I'm a paid employee of the town. But you're not asking me to add the term as additional insured. But you're not transporting any of our assets. You are, me. But we're I'm, not transporting that the, trailer and the UTV and things like that. That's a different, that puts you in a different category. I don't, I don't see the difference. Uh, they could not be transporting equipment. And, and quite often, be. firemen do in all the departments. We have our personal gear with us. Randolph Center only has three pieces of equipment. They can take six guys. How many are on their roster? They're all responding in their personal vehicles. So you're already having this. Well, but we're really, no. I, and I understand what you're saying. We'd have to go look at it. I think there's a. I guess a, there, there should be a. there a statute um, that covers. There should some be some confidence in your chief that There's says he's same. not going to be yeah. foolish enough to it put up. covers a, the, it, the minimum pieces, I think. I think we got into this. Legally, legally it is I different. When you're difference. hooking onto a trailer and, a, and equipment, it's a different game than if you're just Absolutely. in your vehicle responding to the scene. And right. I do believe in your, I mean, even to be legal, Mike, our trailer, we have to register it. We have to register our trucks for weight capacity for our truck and anything it's towing, right? right. Yep. Like that's one thing that's gonna have to happen. And you're gonna have to have an additional insured on your policy. Cause if you're hooking to the town's equipment, you wanna know that that's covered. And I get what you're saying. Maybe the gear is in the truck. To me, that's right. different than hooking onto a trailer heading to a scene with equipment in it. And I, and I do understand that. My point being is your chief isn't going to be foolish enough to allow a half-ton pickup to try to pull this. It's not going to be equipped for you. So taking somebody like myself that has a 41-foot fifth wheel, I do have experience in driving trailers behind me, and there's other guys that have the same. So it mm -hmm. would be the responsibility of your chief of that department to make sure that the list only supplements the ones that have the training or, or knowledge of how to transport a trailer. And that should be put, the burden should be put on him to make sure that the ones that are, that are on the list to be able to tow it have that knowledge. 
But we're not talking knowledge right now. We're talking the legal but side and the I, insurance side of it. But yes, you're right. But my point there would have is, to be a whole training and a certificate, like the same as your truck. Like, right. There would be that whole piece to it, but that's a different piece to me than this piece of figuring out like <clears throat> what that would even look like. It, it seems to me that we're it's pretty complex. That, that like, no one in this room has the the actual knowledge of what what applies here. Because I, I mean, I kind of see both sides here. I don't know who's right. I don't think. I think we need to talk to the it's insurance go back company. To the league. And, and have yeah. them tell us how they handle this and whether, because on one hand, you know, what it seems like what, what, what you're saying, Trini, is that the addition of a trailer makes it a qualitatively different thing. And what you guys are saying is it's more of the same. It's like it's the same kind of thing, it's just even more so. And, but it's not really qualitatively different, quant qualitatively different. And I don't think we actually know who's really right. And I think we just we need to find, we need to talk to an expert who can really say, this is really a different thing and we need to handle it differently than just a firefighter responding to a call in their personal vehicle. Or yeah, it is the same thing, don't worry about it, you guys are all set. I think we need to just find out from the ex an expert who really can just tell us how they handle it. Yeah, we also gotta look at the, there's a statute out there that deals with some of this. And I think it had to deal with <clears throat> some of the personal automobile and, and response, but not. But that it's it's the different. same. The same yeah. experts should know what the statutes are around. I think the league. That's the our league, insurance yeah. company. They would know what it is and us. and what they do. And you know, is there? We got into this. I know we did when we were talking about that whole thing because there was no overarching policy the town could buy to cover those personal automobiles and there was some restrictions on what constituted response if I remember correctly and that I believe came out of the out of a statute all right well we'll have to dig into that one more was there other topics in here though um, did anybody have any other parts that they were concerned about I think the other one is the like who pays all the operating and training costs and maintenance and care and all that of the equipment? Yeah, it's just set up correct? as draft one. If you if we don't want to specify that, it becomes a general fund expense. Those sections essentially, I think they really just go away. I don't. I went through them real quick. I don't think you need to keep them if it's just general operating stuff. It's kind of already covered somewhere else. But depends on where you land. That sounds reasonable to me. <laughs> um, which, what sounds reasonable? That, that is that, to, the, that, the, that the maintenance and expense associated with this particular piece of equipment just comes out of the general okay. fund from the, you know, for that the, that the fire department draws from. And here it says maintenance of the UTV is the responsibility of fire department and nonprofit. Right, that fits with draft one and some of the earlier conversations. But if it's all going to go into the general fund, some of those sections will, yeah, yeah, some of those um, will just come out. Others might just reflect that, for example, if they need to. But I think most of them will come out. Are they ask? Are you asking us to? Do this, or are we just offering it? <laughs> I'm confused. I don't think it had been talked about. It's okay. one of those topics that was still okay. out there, like who's who's doing what. It was identified that it needed to be talked about and a decision made. I think was what the notes and the. So you're proposing changing it from the draft to that the town general fund would. I'm really. I'm just saying that with that that would be okay with me. And but if, if, if but I'm, this is part of the discussion. I mean, so. what were we talking? We're, it's a anybody who's operating it has to go online and do the state class. Yeah. It's what thirty five, forty bucks, it's 35, yeah, somewhere yeah. in there. And no more than you're going to use it. What are you going to do? Change the oil once a year. Oh, oil yeah. change kits, one hundred and ten bucks. 
It's the same one as for the razors, and we just bought some. Um, we don't change the oil on our fire trucks, but we probably change the oil on this one. I know you didn't want to hear that, but <laughs> um, there's some maintenance stuff that we do preventive maintenance on our trucks. We don't change the oil and things like that in our other trucks. But we do the preventative maintenance on it to make sure it's everything, all the equipment on it is, is but ready. But don't you take it, does it get yours go somewhere Village. and has that done, right? Yeah, they're the only ones with bays big enough. Um, so we typically do that if, if you know, if there was a hundred bucks in that, then yeah, we, we would send it down to them with our other equipment to, to do. And then I'd go see Neil Conant like everybody else does. Yeah. Um, what what'd you say, Jim? Go see Neil Conant like everybody else does. He's an amazing mechanic on ATVs and snowmobiles oh, up in okay. Randolph Center. Um, he actually is a consultant to Polaris on some stuff, but you'd never know it. Cool. Um, and what so, else? so we're not talking. Doesn't sound like we're talking about big bucks here. Sounds like it's a pretty, pretty small. No, I mean, how many people are going to go through the class? Everybody wants to drive it. We're right on. Everybody's going to want to drive, right? Not necessarily. I'm, some I'm people, some people don't want to drive the truck, you know, so they don't ever, they don't ever want to jump in the driver's seat. So once we talk about liability and, and I was just thinking it sounds like fun. Say no. Right. So, but you're active, Ross. I mean, we're talking about 10, 20 maybe at the most? Uh, we're 20 right now, so I would say 15 would probably do it. We have three junior members, so they wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's about 600 five, bucks 600 of bucks, yeah. training. You have a training budget, though. Mm -hmm. Right? And then, I mean, it's oil changes based on hours. So I bet sometimes. you would... Uh, <clears throat> But you would still want to do it in studio or anything? No. Nah. Use synthetic. <laughs> It'll go longer. Um, so it's maybe a hundred bucks a year at that. And there's another other maintenance to them. Mm -hmm. Unless you put Air equipment filters. on there that yeah. has to be maintained. We, uh, we use I think that you're talking. We would use that stuff regularly during monthly checks. You know, check money. Like well, and the training is one time, right? So it's a six hundred dollar training that comes out of their training funds for this one year. Right. And then, and then any new person, less. there's right. maybe thirty five, forty bucks out of the training once in a while. I mean, most it's, of this expense that you're talking about, we can absorb it within that budget. I don't see us having to go back to you to get two thousand dollars more in the budget to take care of this. It's um, not like we're asking for a ton of extra money. He reached out to state police and their recreation group. They'll come out and do that training as a group. And then you don't have to pay 35, 40 bucks. Yeah, we would look at the options. I'd rather same as they do for the same bath. So they do the same thing. Right. So. All right. But what were the other decisions we had to make? And we can narrow this maybe down to the whole conversation of... Yeah, it's just if there was anything else, the big thing was collapsing all of the specifics into one, or there's two um, different sections that just reference the, guidelines that they create, whether or not you want them to come back to you to review and adopt. That's kind of the other big question. The rest of the stuff you've covered either through where the expenses go, um, the replacement piece, which you talked about since the very first conversations in there. Um, and at some point we got to figure out the transportation yeah. Piece, but it sounds like there's some more questions I think we there. But kick that one down the road a little bit. So we aren't going to finish this. So the the guidelines and policy one is is one I think the board does have to weigh in on. Um, so when we got into the brain tree case with the snow, with the motorcycle, there um, policy that was adopted by the board had a lot more weight in that case than practice guidelines, whatever that the department had. Uh, so I believe that we do need to have a policy around this that kind of codifies all this and, and it's adopted by the board um, so that it's got that weight to it. I don't know what anybody else thinks, but um, going through that case, policy was the equivalent of um, not law, but it was had a lot more weight to it than just a practice or a procedure. 
for a department if we want to have if we want to require certain things like a training or uh, certain <clears throat> uses or restrictions on the use or whatever I think it's got to be kind of spelled out in this dot you know there's a fair number of things in here that says needs to be in the guidelines I think it should be drafted and come back to the board to adopt it so it has that extra weight to it any thoughts or preferences on that the option is whether the department itself adopts guidelines on the use or whether the board the chief has a accepts comment. them I understand the timeline uh, of that but I think the MOU should focus on ownership and, and expenses. When you get into those things, I think that is put on to the department, not the person donating the equipment. The, uh, the thing in here just says that you will, the question isn't about what's in, the, what goes in here is that there will be guidelines adopt, uh, developed. That's it. The question before the board well, and the piece, the reason it's in here is, and noted that we have to talk about it is, are those guidelines that only the fire department does and it's in-house? Or are those more like a policy type or a, do they need the extra weight of the board adopting them? Right, and I understand that. I just think that if the nonprofit is giving you something, I think noting it in here is just a timing thing, not necessarily needs to be included. You can wait to sign it until the policy is in place. Right? I mean, if, if it takes you three or four months to put a policy in place and you, then you sign it in month five and say, hey, we're accepting this, it's going to be used by these folks, they're, they're going to cover these costs, the town will cover these costs, whatever, and then I don't think it needs to be included per se. Whether you include, if you want to include it or not, that's up to you, obviously, but I just, from my perspective, when you start going into fire department operations in this, the fire department's not necessarily involved with this agreement, right? It's it's kind of two different things. I realize in many cases we're the same people, but it's playing two different roles. It's like, hey, we're going to give you this. You, we're going to pay for some of this. It's going to be used by them. Like, you could have five lines in this agreement. I understand legality, you got to have 200, but, um, but that that's kind of the, the, sim the simpler version, I, I would think. Um, simpler, yes. Um, where, um, so you're want, you're wanting to simplify this down so there's two agree, two different, where it's just a two party and not a three party. Yeah. And if you, you know, whatever your policies you, you want to enact on the fire department to cover it, I understand. I, as part of those discussions on that on that incident in Braintree, and uh, you know, I think that's fire department town policy. If you know, so if you want a three-party agreement or two-party agreement, I just think a two-party agreement would be cleaner, easier. Because if you know, if you say somebody the, the nonprofit is going to make sure they're trained, no, the nonprofit's not going to train. The firefighters are going to train. I realize they're the same people, but it's two different roles. Um, I mean, it depends on how closely you view the, the linkage between the three. I mean, to accept it means that eventually it's going to be deployed. And do you want to put any caveats on the, oh, not caveats, but are there things that tied to the acceptance that you need to see with the deployment and what's the best place to put them. Do you do them separately? Do you wire them into one place? We could do a, a fairly simple agreement to accept it, but the, everything has to stay parked until you have all the other pieces. Well, that's what I, I said. think you this was the, the fifth month to sign it, right? And have the other pieces in place ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as the chief, I understand you want a policy to govern how we use this. Good. As a nonprofit, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> I and right now this is a three-way. This is this is three-way. It's got all the all the entities in it. Yep. Yeah. No, I understand that. I just 
thought maybe we could just simple, simplify the transfer of, of a gift donated to the fire service. And then we can talk, Trevor and I, as, as a department head reporting to the head of departments, and uh, basically say, yep, you guys are going to do a policy. I understand that. I, I'm at the mercy of you guys. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to adhere to? So, so time-wise, I understand. Just with the agreement, I thought maybe you could separate it. Okay. Any other questions? We can't be separated into 10 agreements, right? There's, there's always the possible <laughs> to, to break it down. Um, all right, let's. It can be written up either way. It just depends on how you want them connected and at what point. To a simpler agreement with uh, some kind of uh, make a formal action, or it seems like it's a pretty well known requirement that some of these other pieces be worked out before deployment. And practically speaking, it sounds like they have to. How you get it from point A to point B is kind of a big one. Regardless, but and, and, when you, and when you talk to the LCT, I mean, I don't want to throw the fire departments under the bus, but everybody we talk to, they all transport with personal vehicles, like to know how they're handling that. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's turn on blind eye, like we don't want to know, but yeah, I mean, that's it's pretty risky, especially especially when when sometimes when Bethel responds to us, they're responding in personal vehicles. So if it's our call and they're responding here in a vehicle that's not covered in the way that you talked. Do we now have to tell them to stay home? I realize they're covered under their thing, but now they're on our call. So I'm not sure. But it's still on theirs because they're re responding mutual aid as the Bethel Fire Department. I know, but if so it all if somebody gets injured, now Bethel's going to get sued, you're going to get sued, yeah. et cetera. Everybody's going to yeah. get sued and everybody's going to have to pay out of it. Well, I think there's precedent there that you're responding as a department mutual aid, so it goes back onto the department. But, you know. You're right, everybody's going to come to the table. That's the, just the nature of the beast. What's the role of the nonprofit going forward in the trailer and the UTV? From my view or yours? Yours. <laughs> um, the nonprofit is, is, is donating, that's right. The nonprofit, and, and unless we agree on some, some costs, we, we've identified that we can you know, spend the some of that money in our budget, right? It would be the bigger cost of maintaining the serviceable life of it, right? Because at some point, it's not going to be serviceable for the fire industry, and then at some point, it's not going to be serviceable in general. So at that, at the end of, at the, at that point, the nonprofit would determine, hey, this was great for ten years. Let's let's buy another one, right? Or it just it goes to it gets sold and the money goes. To whatever or, or you know at that point so from the from my perspective the nonprofit is here you go let's pay for some stuff that we agree to at the end of the life see what happens are you seeing something more involved no my head's working on how you separate these out into agreements um, if you go with a separate agreement then it's a an agreement between the nonprofit and the town of ownership coming over to the town. Town's responsible for insuring it. Um, training costs and maintenance. Um, the town's not responsible for replacement. That would be an expense determined by the nonprofit at a later date, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. but, I mean, potentially, but you know, it's it's that, that once the town accepts it, it's just another piece of equipment that we own. And like all the all the equipment, we we decide on a regular basis. You know, what's useful, what we need, how much of different types of things do we need? Like that's, and, then, and those things change over time. So. You know, we, we might decide that when this thing is at the end of its useful life that it's a critical piece of equipment that all departments should have and, and it's just a no-brainer. We just buy a new one or 
You want three four, of these running four, around? Four, I'm just saying, like, I just... <laughs> we can't figure out one. We just... We just, <laughs> but, see, it's, just it's, just an, it's just another piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what you're saying, there's precedence for that, that somebody donated something to the town that became an integral, or perceived an integral part of the fire service, which is a very large expense for the town every year. So the way it's written, it's you have no obligation to replace it. But what that leaves open is the fact that you may, or a future board may choose to. Yeah. You don't yeah. necessarily need to do anything any different. You've established the policy baseline for where you're going to start, but you do have, you do essentially reserve the right to change. Yeah. Of course, we, if we you can't, need. we can't bind what right. a future board decides to purchase or not purchase in the future anyway. So it is already kind of baked in, and that section would stay even in a simpler agreement. And, and then we do a separate document that's a policy on how it can move and the, all the other pieces, like the training, the mm -hmm. whatever. Do other that has town to be in. employees need training to move it with a town vehicle? Yeah, I mean, it's... Um, I mean, what happens if it's needed and somebody is not a firefighter moves it, has to move it, mm -hmm. you know, then you're... Worst case scenario, we could always, and we have our own, it's like highway has trailers, drivers with trailer endorsements on their CDL, if we had to move it, there is the opportunity to take the unit, put it on something else and move it, if we had to, say, for a non-fire use, whatever that might be. I think the trickier one is it's the Sunday afternoon scenario you laid out yeah. and somebody's gone out and had too much fun somewhere deep in the woods and they got to get there and one truck's in Brookfield and the other one's in another direction and the other one's in another direction and maybe the remaining one isn't in service or isn't even big enough for the job and how do they get from A to B? Um, so the... The idea is to move that out of the agreement into a policy. I think if you're going with the two, the two system here, there's the acceptance one with the nonprofit, and then there's the operating guidelines that specify. Would then be a natural place in my mind for how you get it around, mm -hmm. and the insurance questions get answered, and that gets incorporated into mm -hmm. that, along with whatever gets laid out for everything from PPA to loading, whatever makes the most sense and is safe and satisfies the safety In the meantime, it's insurance. sitting at the station and can't move until we get all that ironed out. Have you located any policies from other fire departments or seen any of that? Nothing when you're looking at trainings and all that. Have any of those come along with? I have not found any other departments policies on use of any vehicle outside of cities, like rural towns. Most of them don't post them online. Yeah. Okay. The only examples I saw were from Western County style fire operations, fire districts, that type of thing. But not anything that was strictly municipal that I can recall. Nothing we can steal. It just makes it easier. It for parts, yeah. <laughs> so to throw a small wrench into this. What if we donated a truck to it? It would be a fire department vehicle, a fire service vehicle, brand new, uh, capable of towing that you wouldn't have to train town employees or call them on Sundays or anything like that. It would be sized to be able to transport the trailer and weight of the ETV, et cetera. And it would go under the, essentially the same agreement. At the end of its service life, if you don't want it, you don't you don't buy another one. What's uh, the use of it? Just sits there to move this trailer? No, I I the vehicles that I have in my station can only transport half of my membership. So if we got something with a six man cab, I could transfer all of my membership and my other fire uh, fire police typically take their personal vehicle anyway. So I would get within one or two people being able to transfer my all in, in town owned equipment, no personal vehicles, to a scene. And that would eliminate the other problem where we just, you're not going to the scene period. We have a vehicle that almost any of you can drive. 
you know, we only hook the trailer on when we have a call, otherwise it's able to deploy for other things. Oh boy. See, small wrench. Yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know that I want to take that one on tonight. No, I wouldn't. We got a just, long... Just something to consider as we consider the insurance implications and the operational implications. Mm -hmm. It's already sounds like you're headed into pieces, so maybe we focus on simplifying this while we're answering those insurance questions, so then we can at least get the ownership piece done, get it on the insurance rolls, and yeah, it's there, and that piece is done while the rest of it's in the process, and there's some action. I mean, that sounds like where you're at, but I can make our mind. No, that sounds right to me. Be continued. Okay. Thank you. Unfortunately, <laughs> we're as sick of this on the agenda as you are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Grant award acceptance for the sidewalk scoping study. This is the sixty thousand dollar grant for the extension from where it ends on Route Twelve down toward Shaw's, and then the section on Weston Street that connects better with the senior center, basically, and where the current sidewalk ends. Maybe some improvements along the way. We were awarded. We have to accept it. Our match comes out of sidewalk reserve based on how you discussed it and where the money actually exists for it. Anybody have any questions on that one? None? No. Sounds like just what we were expecting. Okay. Entertain a motion to accept it. Move that we accept the sidewalk scoping study award. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 No oppositions. North Randolph Road projects uh, update on the bid process. Yeah, we got, we did two RFPs based on where we're at with the FEMA process. One was for engineering, and from what the state's feedback was during some of the permitting, one was for the three larger slopes on North Randolph Road. I think we've actually done all the work on the smaller ones at this point. We're pretty close. And then for replacement of the bridge that washed out at the bottom, we got zero responses back to each. Um, the slope one was a little less surprising, given that that was alluded to as a possibility, but. The bridge one was kind of shocking. One of the things we're going to do is regroup, do a request for qualifications, try to attach it. That way it's a little bit of a lower entry point, still get a qualified firm, and we can get through some of the pieces that we need to get to. Um, so I've got a draft that's 50-60% uh, done and out. Uh, hopefully we can get done and out soon and keep moving with that. But otherwise, we have the temporary bridge in place, so everything's still open and working. Um, and the slopes haven't gotten that much worse. <laughs> Seems like there's a little July's bit. July is coming. <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit missing, I think, every time, but they haven't. Signi I mean, but not to the point we have to close the road. We still have Jersey barriers and some other safety items up. But. So I just wanted to provide an update. Originally, we had had this bookmarked as a ward, potentially, of those bids. So it just sort of sets us back a little bit. Don't know that we'll need any FEMA extensions, that type of stuff, but when we met with them last time, we mentioned this was where we were at and what we were going to do. And I think as long as we're competitive in the process, they care less about how we're competitive. Um, so they've let us use everything from the formal process to the documenting who you talked to and got quotes from, or at least tried to engage if there's some level of, of that in there. So try to go back with that. The slope one's a little trickier because that is, that's the key to unlocking the state permit, really. Um, yeah, the FEMA wanted to see the um, geotechnical study of the mm -hmm. entire, of both sides, the North Randolph Road and Kibbe Road. Yeah. And their mitigation folks are following that one just in case. The different categories are sort of like the general response one, which if we just went in and fixed it, then everything else kind of falls under that. If we're into widening the road, moving pieces, acquiring property, rerouting, that's where their mitigation people come in. It's a slightly different process. But we're still working on it. We're just 
put an O for in the box score. That's why you play the next one. All right. Any other questions on those? Policy ordinance review project. Right on time. Yeah. I just <laughs> wanted to give a little heads up. This project's been on a bucket list for a while. We've got a number of it's everything policies to ordinances that are anywhere from 40 plus years old to just maybe slightly dated, um, you know, they're five to seven years old. And then the idea would be to try to create a calendar where we can review them all to get them kind of current, say over a three year period. And the reason why I'm taking a multi-year one is with the ordinances, the process for adoption or amendments is just a little bit longer, there's a little more to it. I don't know if you remember from the last one we did, you got your process to get to action and it's 60 days essentially before it's effective. Doesn't mean we couldn't be working on other ones, but to just try to stack them in a way that makes sense. Um, and the same thing with the policies. The ideally at the end of that, we've got an updated set of everything and you're into a review calendar. It's like regular maintenance on a vehicle. You just take a look at it. You don't want to do anything with it. There aren't any problems with it. You note it, you move on. Um, but if there's something you want to do with any of them, you do that. Some of them might stay in a three year cycle, like a Personnel policy is probably not a bad one to at least be checking in on more regularly, but some of them, whether it be ordinance policies, might build a five, seven years might be sort of more appropriate at the end of the day, just because things don't change. So it's really just to kind of describe the project. We'll sort of take, if you're good with it, take a first cut at prioritizing which order the different things go, knocking out a little bit of a calendar, and we'll start to walk through them at some point once we get started. Trevor, would you remind us what the difference is between a policy and an ordinance? Yeah, the ordinances are essentially think of them as your, what they call your police powers. So statute gives you certain other regulatory powers kind of outside your normal powers. So the anything like the traffic ordinance is a perfect example where you can set speed limits, determine where stop signs are in our parking zones. And then you can enforce those through a ticketing process essentially. So they're a little heftier. They carry more legal weight. There's a commitment to due process in them in terms of if you get notice, you can appeal, you can have this sort of work out. Whereas a policy is more of this is how we're going to operate. We determine a little more freely where it is. We can change, adopt, amend. They don't have that same process for that. So that's essentially the breakdown. They're often, so when we regulate nuisances, if we do that, that's a police power, so it falls into the regulatory framework. Whereas if we're personnel rules or policy driven or purchasing for example um, or any smaller ones like when you're talking about the TV operation it's he I mean, heft is one easy way to think of it one's the you should the other one's the enforcer that makes sure you should uh, great thank you so I'd like to do that with these there's few other process things we might bring here just to try to, I think we did a really good job surviving for a couple of years, but nice to tighten up practices. Now that we have a little bit of theoretical data. That's my disc golf research, so of course. Um, speaking of finding policies of other towns, <laughs> where can we see the lot, like, I know you're going to pull together a thing, but is there a place we can start? Yeah, we've got, they should all be up on, both the ordinances and the policies up on our website under, um, it's one of the tabs, if you go down and see it, okay. you know the drop downs, I forget which, it's like second from left, I think, maybe where it is, where it is, where it has been. So you can kind of see them all um, right down to some of the revised police policies. And then part of this is also as we go through and put them in order, it'll let us say do we have the most current version out there um, and start to keep a log also when you took action so you know last amended by all that stuff because we you guys had revised the traffic ordinance a couple of years ago and for whatever reason the old version was still up on the website so I'm sure that we swapped those out fun all the good stuff yeah <laughs> <laughs> All right, town clerk, town treasurer, vacancy. Yeah, we've got to go back out to advertise. We lost our preferred candidate. Um, 
nobody's beating down our door to serve in that role. We've tried to work with um, Ann and Joyce, who are in there in the full-time capacity, then helping us out, try to figure out a summer schedule with them. Um, we can talk about it in the executive session. The system has some stuff that needs to be taken care of at different points that precludes her from being in there as, as often as has been planned. So trying to navigate those changes in services that come up. Um, a couple of things that we've reached out is to keep twisting this Rubik's Cube, one of my favorites, twist the Rubik's Cube and see if you can solve it. Um, there is a provision. It doesn't help us in that you can't do it on your own as part of your legislative portfolio, your policy portfolio, but there is a way that you can enable non-residents to serve in an elected clerk treasurer role that we should run down the process on. I suspect it's going to have to be a floor vote based on the advice we got when we went through the appointment question and the Australian ballot question in the town meeting, which is a bit of a wrinkle, because if it was, you could pick the balloting method, for example, or it was Australian ballot, you could do it with the August primaries, and now we've broadened the candidate pool. Doesn't mean we couldn't do a special, just special election in August for a pretty particular question. The turnout's going to be a little low. But that's a workaround that didn't exist until recent years that yeah. we're digging for something else. But it's not an immediate fix. Um, and then with those primary elections, we're thinking ahead to that worst case Putney-ish scenario. Um, ask the Secretary of State's office just to make sure we knew what happened if we if we don't have a clerk treasurer in place. And the system isn't able to step in to that role for whatever variety of reasons. How are we going to make sure that elections are run? And there is a provision in state law that allows the Board of Civil Authority to appoint a voter of the town to handle that. So we could seek someone to serve in that role, at least to still get that done. The challenge being that, much as I know about local government as a voter, that's not something I'd want to step in and suddenly be responsible for. But there's a whole bunch. Goes with can, you, can you say that last part again? I'm not quite sure I understand how that's different from just finding someone to be the... the so we can run elections. They can just do the from, election. Right. You can appoint somebody oh, that oh, only okay, oversees okay, okay, the election. Okay, okay. I missed that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, so if we still carry the vacancy into August, we probably have to have the Board of Civil Authority appoint a presiding officer or temporary elections officer. So, so when you sent around the, the, the reference to that statute that mm -hmm. you just referred to, um, that was that was really that's really interesting and potentially yeah. really helpful. Um, my reading of it is that it didn't seem to really address how that gets voted on by the town at all. Right. It didn't actually say whether it could be by ballot or if it needed to be on the floor. Um, I'm not sure how you actually <laughs> would resolve that because it just seems like it's just not yeah. alluded to at, at one way or the other. It's an order of operations kind of question. And if you go back to the advice we got when we went through the appointment in Australian ballot conversations, because there was a specific vote in, I forget the year, to vote essentially all the money questions by Australian ballot and do all the election stuff by Australian ballot, everything else fell into the other category, which was still done from the floor. I see, I see, and I so see. So that's how that we got sense. into doing those two that way. And if it's silent, and it's not a money question. Mm -hmm. Could be that there's something else that completely upends that theory, but the general sort of right. No, no, no. That through. makes that makes sense. Yeah. I get it. I get it. No, yeah. I, I think you're, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so, but this prov so in in this provision of statute though, it it doesn't say it doesn't give us restrictions on when that vote can take place, right? We no. can call a, a, an in person vote. Mm -hmm. Um, given how important it is for us to fill this position, I don't see why we don't just call a vote, like ASAP. It says that an annual or special meeting called for the We just call a special meeting of the, of the voters and say, we've been trying really hard to find somebody. This mm -hmm. isn't working. We have to fill this position. This provision in statute, which would allow us to fill it with a non-resident, yeah. a non-Randolph resident, um, can, we, can we do that? Still elected, so it upholds still, the conversation from March. Still, still, yep, still an elected position, and we we've, we've given it a you know a fair shake, and and we're not we just can't keep going like this indefinitely. So it might get and, some short. And there's really no 
I mean, the worst thing that'll happen is the voters saying no. Like, we really haven't lost. But should we do that? Anything. Like, I mean, think about it. We're if we bring in somebody that's a non-resident, then in March we have to have a resident, no, or we this, stay non-resident going forward. This would enable forward. either one to run again. So you're then opening it up for somebody not in Randolph to run for a Randolph position that, that's that important. The only well, two we were talking about having an appointed position, which would have been... I know, but at least you can... Anywhere. Right, but you have some say over it, right? Your select board has a say over that, or your town manager over that person versus, you know, I don't know. Um, I mean, not sure I'm not I'm sure struggling really with that. I'm not sure it's like really that. that different. I mean, given the fact that or we I mean, need that person. Could we put it back on the back? Could we put it back to Couple. make an Australian ballot? You could go both yeah. again, yeah. You can do a special I mean, meeting. I mean, I feel like we could, but we can all. We kind of mm, failed that. Well, well, <laughs> the, the other the other part of this is 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 later in our agenda, right? Which is about updating our charter or creating a charter, a town charter, and you know, it was the when we when we went to town meeting, it was the position of the select board that we wanted to make this position an appointed position, and that could be something that we try again through. Like the charter process, and we'll get a, a much, you know, bigger cross section of the electorate to, to weigh in on that, um, and so I think, try having, doing a special meeting to get somebody in place temporarily, and then tr seeing if we can go through the the charter route to get it a, as an appointed position more permanently, um, would make would make sense. That's it as an overall strategy. It's a timeline to do a charter. So the charter is not going to go through easy. So that's Charter's definitely not a quick one. answer. Yeah. Right, so you could stack them, which would be a little odd, but you're using the tools available to you. So it could be that you go for the special meeting, the problems, the pool, we're able to do the short-term thing. If you work on either the charter or the appointment, you know, the Australian vote, and I think the appointment question has to be every year at town meeting. There's a weird quirk to that one. So even if you don't want to do the charter, but want to take another swing at the appointment piece, I'd at least buy some time for that. Right. It presumes, though, that we'd be able to find somebody still. And I mean, that's the one wrinkle, is we could go through all this, the voters could say, yeah, we get it. And We're going to be much more likely to find someone if we can pick from all of Vermont rather than just from Randolph. Yeah. Yeah. How apt is, like, somebody from Burlington steps up to do a short term to get elected by the Randolph voters ongoing. I, don't know. I, mean, I just wonder if we're setting ourselves up to train somebody and then be screwed. I mean, we run that risk I know. no matter what. I don't like it. I like the appointed but, one because yeah. it's an employee, you hire them, you, you invest in them, train them. Right, but right, all our turn right that. now is, is we have this empty position yeah. for Indefinitely. So the the question of appointing versus elected can't come up until town meeting day. I got to double check. But there's a quirk with that's what I saw with that one. I think that's, I remember right. That, and that, that was, was where Putney got hung up was that they couldn't do that piece until. Yeah, we don't get another shot until town meeting to do that again. That and maybe you know maybe. <laughs> like you know, enough people to right. put any of us on the ballot at town meeting. Right, right. <laughs> like, and so, so even if, right. even if we, we find that we don't have enough time to go through the charter process before town meeting, which we might be able to, um, but that's like, we don't have to decide that right now. But if we don't, then we could, you know, hire, we could appoint somebody to the vacancy who's a, a Vermont resident. And, assuming the voters are okay with that in the short term. And then at next town meeting, we just go back to the voters again and say, you know what, we, we tried it and it, and, it, and it didn't work. We'd really like to just be able to appoint somebody. Um, and that, I mean, that was a close vote. It was. I mean, really. So it could easily, it could very easily go the other way now that we've, we've shown that it's, it is just harder to find somebody locally than it had been in the past. I think the, that was, people were like, a lot of people were bought into the argument that, well, this is how we've always done it, and we've always managed to make it work, so let's just keep doing what we've <laughs> been doing, surfaced. and it'll be fine. Yeah. But we've seen that the world has, has actually really changed in a way that makes it not fine anymore, and so mm -hmm.
I think we just have to convince a handful of people of that, and we can get an appointed position in place. And it was interesting to see the Board of Civil Authority has a, one of the applications is, I came to the town offices multiple times and nobody was working in the town clerk's office. I'm like, hmm, gee, told yeah. you so. <laughs> well, they've been pretty good about it, but you can yeah. see and hear and feel the frustration. So what would we need to do to have a special in-person meeting to, yeah. to decide this one question? I have to go back and look. I think it's really, I think it's, you just, there's a regular vote to call it, and then there's the process that we have to be far enough in advance, make sure we've got a time, a date, those types of pieces. I don't, we might have some notice requirements, you know, post here, this many days out. Um, so we just would have to put that all down. It's generally in that 30 to 45 day range from when and we can't too do that. Dissimilar from when you do it's, not po it's not on our agenda as a as an item to be decided, so we can't do decide that yeah. right now, right? So it might make some well, sense. Why can't we? It's part of our town clerk. Is it part treasurer of treasurer vacancy? So you, could we? What you have me do though is put it all together, and then when you get together in July, because we do, we can do another round of advertising. We shake the tree a little bit while we get ready. It doesn't set you back that much to wait till July to say to do it. Cause it we're doing a special in August, front of August, end of August. It's going to be real low turnout, no matter what you do. And still gets us plenty of time in advance. So we can go for another round of advertising here in town. And then we can also start to talk or see if there's anybody outside of town that might take it on, even if it's just sort of a short term. You know, like, I don't want to run for election, but if I can be in the role and till then and help you out. I just want to make sure we link it up because of the special, I don't even have the language for you in terms of what to say. And that's what I'm going to make sure we get right. Because it does seem really urgent. And I, mean, I would be willing to have a special select board meeting like next week once we have the wording involved yeah. in terms of what, what our motion would be to create the, a special in person election. We could do that too. Um, it could be mostly remote. But Judy and I, or maybe just even me, be here. We'd run the Zoom cases. It'd be a really everybody short Everybody came in, yeah, and you would just want to even set you up that way, too. And that I'm probably just... puts you uh, about a month out. And it, giving us the week also helps us link up, I think, to make sure that if we need to go with a temporary elections presiding officer that we've got that person linked up to. I, I'm guessing okay. based on who's around, who's knowledgeable, who's helping us out. Just probably fire my choice if she's around and willing. Um, Emery so would probably step in for a and then it's true, Emery's just still for in that town. one meeting yeah. and play that role too. Yeah. So we might have some options with some folks who know how these things yep. run, which would be that's a real benefit to not be <laughs> <laughs> following a voter. <laughs> you know, out on the street, hey, you want to run an election? Come on. <laughs> it's probably right. some eighteen year olds just saying their oath that would make step right in. So we can queue it up here for you. I got a couple of kids home from college for some I know. Summer job, right? Because we've got kind of part of their role. Yeah, so. the JPs often they're also on the BCA, I think, right? There's the We're yeah, all I'm on sorry. the BCA too. Yeah. So if you got time. <laughs> There's no select board members running, so there's no conflict for you. <laughs> All right. Consider appointing additional assistant treasurers for signatures. Okay, that's all for here. Note to self. This comes from with no clerk treasurer, and if the assistant's not around, those are the two people who can sign checks. Um, it makes it hard for us to pay people, pay bills, all that stuff. Um, this would provide us with some capacity to keep doing that. Um, it's a really quirky process in that normally the clerk treasurer would appoint assistant treasurers since we don't have one. What you're essentially using is statute that assumes that you have an intransigent one instead, a stubborn one. So you'll make the appointments, and when your request goes unanswered for 10 days, 
the appointments become effective. Interesting. So our imaginary vacant treasurer who just won't yield on these appointments. We're going to force that imaginary person to do that. And so Anne and Joyce are already appointed as assistant clerks, so they'd be on there. They know the process. It wouldn't break any of our controls. Like that, That's what's nice about this. The way we approve, the way we review, none of that changes. It just lets us perform that final act of signing. And then Judy would be our, in a case of emergency, break glass signer as well. <laughs> Look at the excitement. Can you feel it? <laughs> so this provides us with that. So what you will be doing is you essentially authorizing me to send a letter to the clerk treasurer stating that you've made these appointments or that you're recommending. I forget. It's in statute. I'll just pull right from it and then start the clock. And we're recommending all three, or did em Emery didn't appoint Ann and Joyce before he left? Just kept them as the clerk thing. There was some conversation about controls and finances and stuff, and kept it pretty narrow because most of the functions in the office are. Paper shuffle. Yeah. Point of sale. I mean, there's a lot of point of sale terminal kind of stuff. So it didn't seem as necessary if we were still able to sign stuff. Um, okay. Anybody have any concerns with that? Sounds like we need to do it. Feeds right into that need to find somebody to do the job, doesn't it? Sure does. <laughs> Entertain a motion. I move that we appoint assistant, um, additional assistant treasurers um, as needed. Second. The treasurer's authorized to send the letter. Is that what you need is authorization from the board to send the letter? Doesn't hurt. In case the clerk treasurer gets all nimbly bimbly with me, I can. <laughs> if he's talking to you at night, you got a problem. Mm. <laughs> when you answer. I say it's yes, only a problem sorry. if I talk back, right? <laughs> so, so, so moved. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. So we already uh, voted on the grand list extension, so we just have to ratify that. I'll move that we ratify the grand list extension. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Initial discussion on a town charter. I talked about making you a flow chart, and I found this from VLCT, which is not as visually interesting as that would be, but gives you a general sense. I'm sorry, they were supposed to two side on me. Well, they did. Um, gives you a general sense of some of the process elements for adoption. Obviously, there's a little nuance that comes into play. So, this is more of the back end of the process. Um, the front end, you have a little more. Um, Ability to be creative with how you shape it. I've seen everything from boards just take it on with staff assistance to um, people form charter committees, even. Um, you have the ability to submit this to the voters in an annual special meeting. There are certain hearing and notice requirements. This is where this is a little different than some of the other actions. Um, and so you can see there's posting things. It's We do this sort of special stuff for bond votes for, you know, there are a few other things that we have to notice differently than the normal business. Um, much like zoning regs, we'd probably, because it's a brand new one, unless it's really short, um, we post a summary of the things that would go and then where you can see the whole thing. Um, so website, town office, usual places for that. There's the multiple hearings, any revisions, um, the way that you can notice. You, uh, Stephanie's in the waiting room. <clears throat> Just get back to her hotel room, she says. And then you can note in the method of voting and ballot requirements, the vote on the charter proposal must be conducted by Australian ballot. So this is where statute specifically calls for it, so it falls outside of that earlier protocol of if you didn't say. Right. And then after we're available, we do the certification stuff that heads off to the General Assembly and 
falls into a timeline there. Um, I get an idea world when you think about time, turnout and timing to get in front of the legislature. If there was something ready to go for November, that's the ideal. We're going to have a big turnout, big election. That's why Australian ballots, so everybody's voting through that methodology anyway. That's pretty aggressive from a dead stop in mid-June. Oh, especially um, with everything else. Right. Yeesh. Unless you want to go really simple, um, what I'd call the Waits Field style of charter, where they just boiled it down to there's a bunch of reserve sections in it. This was back when you had to sort of do appointment of the clerk treasurer through a charter model, so they've got those pieces in there. So it's the bare bones, it's the starter kit. Mm -hmm. um, and so you could throw a few things like that in there. Votes by Austria. So you can keep the really simple one, and then some of these process elements are the same. There's nothing that says you can't adopt one and then revise it within the following year or two. Yeah. Um, Charter revisions happen all the time. Do, yeah, we, the chair. do we have a list <clears throat> of things that are in a typical charter? And we can go through and get, like, what are the non controversial ones? And that would let us get a charter on the books. Is that yeah, the. I think that's what you're referring to with the Batesfield. It, yeah, but yeah. this is where we could use. Um, I was just wondering yeah. the ones you've seen come through I, up there, or you can just. They were all so different because yeah. usually they're you know most. They're they're just all they're just all they're all over the place. I don't think there's really stuff that comes through the legislature, which is standard. And, and most of them at this point are <laughs> Never are, mind are, just are the revisions treasures. where they're trying to they're trying to address a, a specific yeah. thing. They're already there. Have one. There's so, not many new ones coming through. Not typically. I mean, they do happen, but yeah. um, mm -hmm. but well, we could probably come up with either through looking through them or figuring some way to. But, yeah, My wife went to an AI conference, and this is the kind of thing that she described as something it can do, and so that she might actually. I have um, no understanding of how it works. I'm afraid of robots, like I'm afraid of horses, even though they're not the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, I could ask maybe, and that could pull from the. 40 something charters that are out there sort of what are the similar elements and that would be a pretty good guess as to what's non-controversial mm -hmm. we could always do it by hand too but um, mm -hmm. but I think you're talking about stuff that keeping it really simple the stuff that's already done that's already in there that's yeah. very general in nature election or appointment of clerk treasurers um, questions by Australian ballot if we wanted to change our ordinance adoption process so it's not 60 days to effective there's language already in the Essex charter that has similar process but shorter appeal in effective window so you make a case and a few others have adopted versions of that so even if they're not the same there's that that would help us with effectiveness if we stayed to that kind of realm I think we'd be all right yeah. if you want to regulate something that the state's not regulating that's where I think you tend to get bogged down yeah I'm just wondering if we're if we're thinking that charter is the way to get to the issue of a town clerk, town treasurer, and some of these pieces that are so important, how do we streamline getting mm -hmm. that in play and then come back and pick up some of the more Yeah, and I really like the idea of just getting something in place that has non-controversial elements mm -hmm. that will allow us to do some of these things which we'd like to do that nobody's going to be like, oh, that's a really bad idea because it you know, isn't to if we just come up with a bunch of things that everybody's like, I mean, some people will object to the the town clerk. I mean, obviously, we have, we did see that resistance, but I mean, that would be the one that we'd have to yeah. kind of fight for. Yeah. When you're talking of what was our last presidential was you know, closer to thirty something percent turnout versus town meetings. By the time we got to that question, there were forty one total, right? Or was that the who voted in favor? Forty one who voted it was a very against small or in favor? Yeah. Of our registered I don't voters. know what the math is, but it's there was a not very quite little. eighty people in the room. I don't think. Yeah. So, so you do. It, I mean, it's sort of the best advantage, the best time to take advantage of what's likely to be the largest turnout for a four-year window, at least, because um, you've got contested to everything potentially. Um, I, mean, I think it's worth going for it if we can. If it's that easy, mm -hmm. I mean, if we're going to be taking a lot of staff time and a lot of process to get. You know, just to get to the draft of what we want to present. Yeah. I think then we got to look at how we're prioritizing the hours that we have. I think. Because we got some pretty big things still that we got to keep moving. If we keep it simple and we strip the existing ones for parts, um, 
that's a doable level if we're trying to create new sections yeah. well, we'll just be before the legislature every year for four or five years as we add another part to it right like, yeah. we could then yeah, that would yeah. Be i mean that's part of the thing and they wait until the end mm -hmm. of the session usually anyway they mm -hmm. just it depends you know it really depends some yeah. it's a, especially Urgency. um at the beginning of a new biennium right. where the GovOps committee doesn't really have like a lot of stuff that they're that they're working through like it's it wouldn't be that weird for them to just pick up a charter that's easy use january and, and just get it yeah. and get it going mm -hmm. and that way the, the the general assembly has something stuff to start voting on um which, which train is the new members on the process because thing. because early in the biennium yeah. there's nothing for the for the full body to actually do because nothing's come out of committees so a lot of times yeah. these kinds of things actually do get um worked on pretty quickly at the beginning of a new term i just always see a lot of them on the calendar like in the last week or two yeah they're kind of sprinkled throughout though it really just depends upon what the priorities are of the GovOps committee <laughs> um, at, the, at the time. Yep. Right. And, um, yeah, and then the idea of, you know, sort of you know, along with our, you know, updates of policies and ordinances, this is going to be the kind of thing that we have on our list every year. It's like, yep. is there something that we want to do to our charter this year? And it could be a little thing or it could be a big thing, depending upon mm -hmm. what our capacity is. Yeah, and I could envision those coming, so you come out of town meeting, come out of the elections, you do your organization meeting, but that April meeting, for example, might be a good one to check in on all that, because you've got your whole sort of work year ahead of you when you think of the town meeting cycles. So that if you do want to dig in, it just becomes, that's the season for yeah. good governance initiatives. Yeah, yeah. That's it's really, it's really pretty, exciting. It's pretty exciting yeah. to be able to get on that kind of schedule and, and, and keep us you know it's keeping on it that's the challenge larry <laughs> yeah sure, sure but it's, immediate but, but this is the kind of thing that once you're once you're on it and you get going it's maintenance rather than the heavy lift yeah. you know yeah. and, if it, and it'll you know but this is what a lot of stuff that we're trying to do is um get things in place so that our future lives are easier right yeah <laughs> so we, this will fall into that bucket on that topic and then there'll be 10 more that'll take its place though <laughs> all right hey guys, i have a question if i can jump in hi everybody everybody hey, sorry for joining you guys late um if we did um if we did changes to the charter would that have to go on the ballot every year or how would that work from the town side before it got to the state yeah it, once you've got one in place any amendments would go through it's pretty much the same process as the adoption so there's a vote um, a chance for a revote if you needed it, and then it certified goes to the legislature. So you still have a whole kind of run up. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Yep. I think even the notice requirements are the same for an amendment as it is for adoption. So it's, if I'm remembering right, it's the same process. Okay. Um, anything under ARPA funds? I'm just the hanging in item. there. The question really is if you want to try to do just the special dedicated some way to goose this thing we still have some time we got to the end of the calendar year but it'd be nice to move it i mean part of that process is once we know when we're really going to take it up we can put it early on the agenda we can revise everything that's come in get updates on it because those lists that the committee saw and the list that you've seen already those are all all over the place at this point in terms of people found other funding other things have come up Aren't we almost out of money? Pretty close. <laughs> We've got, some there well, still. I mean, it all depends on how you view any disaster related match, um, really. Because right. if you don't have that in the mix, we're about halfway through a little more. But if you still save three, four hundred thousand for that, you're talking probably about a couple hundred thousand bucks. So that's the other thing. Do we know, though, what that match is yet? Not look at that work being done on the stock farm road right now and then if we look at we don't yeah. really know what's going to happen on the north randolph road those are the big variables there are those two projects there fortunately a lot of that's going to be swept into the july so yep. it's 10 percent instead of 25 percent. that also really helps too and then of that 10 or 25 wherever they fall the state makes a portion of that right yep so 
Yeah. If it's and 25, it's tw we split it 12 and a half. Yeah. Each. Some equipment. I think if it's the 10, we split it probably 50 50. If it's 12 and a half each if it's 25, but if it goes to 10. Well, it depends on which standards you've adopted. Oh, right? That's and right. We've, uh, so we may still have like seven. We haven't adopted, we aren't in on one of them. There's a floodplain related one that we didn't. Yeah. We don't have. So I think we're in the. Lane. Yeah, we were in we were like four tiers. We were yes. in tier three or something. I yeah. think we pay we pay fifteen percent and they pay ten percent okay. if it's on the twenty five and I forget what it breaks down to if it goes down to the ten. Yeah. Thankfully Stock Farm Road will be in the ten, North Randolph Road will be in the ninety ten. Yeah. It's really just that mud season I that's gonna say go we in the pay seven and they pay three or something. Yeah. Something odd like that. So we'll also be able to person. calculate that a little bit. Um I think it's worth getting some level of kind of a where we're at, mm -hmm. what that value looks like, or, and what we're estimating maybe that the match has got to be on the FEMA stuff. Um, and then kind of having the discussion of what that dollar value is if we want to move forward and send that out into some other projects that were listed, or if it's like contingency type values and you know, we're down to fifty sixty thousand dollars that's probably more of a contingency in my mind but maybe there's a project or two that we want to push forward it would make sense to get it out if there if we could identify that there's definitely more there than what's going to be needed it would probably make sense to get it out sooner yeah and there's not a deadline like there is for the state end of funds. the year right? end of the calendar year yeah is it still to, well to obligate and then spend we've got to spend it by 26. I so we, something was just happening to i don't for the state stuff to roll into general funds i didn't go to town there might be an option where you can i don't know if it's through resolution or what the mechanism is essentially declare it all even beyond what you did when you declare it when we declared it all there was the standard deduction or whatever they called it and so it became use it how you need to without sort of the preset categories there might be a way to essentially declare it surplus on top of that and then stick it into your general fund and meet the obligation I know we're looking at our state yeah. ARPA stuff and trying to figure out there's some shifts happening with the deadline so yeah I was just spent <laughs> the fact that we're hanging on to a little bit is we're a little bit of an outlier, I think, even still, too, that we have some. Yeah. Because either because of need or process or whatever, they, and we thankfully didn't have the actual revenue loss like some of the committees did. Okay. All right. Manager's report. Anything to add? Nothing to add from what's written. All right. Then we will go into executive session. It's mostly for the like a collective bargaining update. I listed a few from last time. Um, so you could list them all as they're written for ease, or you could take out the real estate and legal advice ones. Do we need to have, um, gotta have the finding to first. find that yep. we need to go in? That it's prudent and that premature general knowledge will get me in trouble with the library. Okay. Anybody want to move that one? So moved. <laughs> <laughs> Second. Just I'm so glad time. you joined us. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Um, opposed? Motion carries. So now this is the one to enter. You might as well just put all the categories if we don't use them. So moved. That makes it a copy and paste for us too. So. <laughs> we are all about making your life as easy as possible. You're making Judy's life easier. Judy wants <laughs> coffee, especially <laughs> Judy. I appreciate it, but it's really, we're making Judy's life easier. We had a motion, did we get a second? Second. Oh. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We are in executive session.